After receiving the necessary blessings and instructions, Arinze set out on his journey, unaware of the sinister plot that had been hatched against him. As soon as Arinze departed, the High Priest secretly alerted Prince Ukandu that the time had come to execute their plan. Ukandu swiftly dispatched his three most loyal guards, instructing them to ambush and kill Arinze in the forest. The guards followed Arinze's trail, tracking him into the dense woods. As Arinze reached a secluded area, the guards struck without warning, attacking him from behind. They mercilessly beat him, raining down blow after blow until Arinze lay motionless on the ground, his body battered and lifeless. Satisfied with their heinous deed, the guards left Arinze's body in the forest, believing their task was complete. However, unbeknownst to them, a female hunter had witnessed the brutal attack from a distance. The female hunter, horrified by the senseless violence, rushed to Arinze's aid. He gently lifted Arinze's limp body and carried him back to his village, laying him down in his humble hut. The hunter frantically tried to revive Arinze, administering various herbs and remedies in a desperate attempt to save his life. But to his dismay, Arinze showed no signs of breathing or response, no matter how hard the hunter tried. As the evening approached, the high priest, unaware of the treacherous events that had transpired, went to Arinze's home to collect the items for the final cleansing and rituals. However, he found Chief Uzo sitting outside, visibly worried about Arinze's prolonged absence. He should have been back by now, Chief Uzo said, his brow furrowed with concern. The forest is not far, and he should not have taken this long. The high priest, feigning ignorance, suggested that they wait until the next morning, hopeful that Arinze would return by then. However, his words betrayed the sinister truth. He knew exactly what had befallen Arinz in the forest, and he had no intention of revealing the treacherous plot to Chief Uzo. As night fell, the hunter continued his efforts to revive Arinzi, but each attempt was met with failure. Arinzi's body remained motionless, his spirit seemingly departed from this world. The hunter, unwilling to give up, redoubled his efforts, determined to save the life of the man who had been so brutally attacked. He prayed to the ancestors for guidance and strength, hoping that their divine intervention would breathe life back into Arinzi's broken form. The next morning dawned, and still, there was no sign of Arinzi's return. Chief Uzo had spent the night outside, unable to sleep, waiting and hoping for his son's arrival. Tears streamed down his face as worry consumed him, wondering what could have befallen Arinz in the forest. Meanwhile, the high priest sent for Prince Ukandu, seeking confirmation that their sinister plan had been carried out successfully. Ukandu arrived at the high priest's residence, and the two men celebrated their perceived victory, believing that Arinza had been eliminated. With a sense of urgency, the high priest set out to check on Arinza's status, hoping to find him absent. As he approached Chief Uzo's home, he saw the elderly man still waiting outside, his eyes filled with concern. If Arinze does not return by tomorrow, we will have no choice but to make Prince Ukandu the new king over the Five Kingdoms, the High Priest declared, attempting to mask his deceit with an air of authority. Chief Uzo, unwavering in his faith, responded calmly, Hold on, the ancestors will bring Arinzi back. If he does not return by tomorrow, I still will not install Prince Ukandu as the ruler. The high priest, growing impatient, warned Chief Uzo that the kingdom could not linger without a leader for much longer, as things were already becoming unstable. After voicing his ultimatum, he departed, leaving Chief Uzo alone with his worries. Undeterred, Chief Uzo remained outside, calling upon the ancestors to guide and protect Arinze. He refused to lose hope, 
believing that the divine forces that had chosen Rinze as the true king would not abandon him. As night fell once again, Chief Uzo remained steadfast in his vigil, his eyes fixed on the path that led into the forest. He refused to succumb to despair, clinging to the belief that Arinze would return and the ancestor's plan would be fulfilled. While the hunter continued her tireless efforts to revive Arinze, unaware of the turmoil and uncertainty gripping the village, she prayed and administered every remedy she knew, determined to bring life back into Arinze's battered body. Meanwhile, as news of Arinze's apparent failure to return spread, Prince Ukundu and his loyal bodyguards began jubilantly celebrating their imminent coronation. They cheered and reveled joyously, as Ukundu promised to shower them all with immense wealth and riches beyond their wildest dreams. The arrogant prince lavished effusive thanks and rewards upon the bodyguards, for their crucial efforts had enabled him to seize the ultimate prize, becoming the High King over all five kingdoms. As raucous celebrations rang out from Ukandu's quarters, an air of solemnity and worry hung over Chief Uzo's modest home. When the devastating news reached the wise healer about the High Priest's sinister plans to install Ukandu as king in Arinze's place, Uzo became deeply troubled. However, his faith in the ancestors and their divine plan for his adopted son never wavered. Uzo remained steadfastly planted outside the front of his home, keeping a silent vigil just as he had done countless times awaiting Arinze's return. The elderly man's eyes stayed focused on the horizon, periodically closing as he directed impassioned prayers to the ancestors to protect Arinze and bring him home safely before it was too late. No matter how dire the situation appeared, with Ukandu's corrupt celebrations growing louder, Uzo's trust in the ancient ways remained unshakable. He knew the ancestors would never allow a heart as pure and noble as Arinze's to be extinguished, no matter how deceitful or malicious the forces working against him might be. The evening before the coronation event, the hunter, who had been trying to revive Arinzi, grew weary, as Arinzi's body showed no signs of breathing or life. Believing Arinzi was dead, the hunter decided to discard the body in the midnight hours to avoid being labelled a murderer. As night fell, Arinzi's body remained cold and motionless, having not moved since the days of the attack. The hunter carefully carried Arinzi's lifeless form intending to dispose of it deep in the forest. Upon reaching his chosen location, he gently laid Arinz down and looked at him one final time before turning to leave. However, the hunter had only taken a single step away when she heard a faint cough and wheezing sound. Whipping around in a rush, she saw Arinzi's chest ever so slightly rising and falling. Arinze was alive. The hunter swiftly scooped him up and hurried back to his small hut, cradling Arinz's fragile body. Once inside, the hunter tended to Arinz, preparing a steaming hot tea to help revive his battered frame. As Arinz slowly sipped the revitalizing brew, strength and awareness gradually returned to his weary form. Finally, his eyes fluttered open and he asked in a raspy voice what had happened and how many days he had been here. The hunter proceeded to recount the harrowing events, explaining how men dressed as royal guards had viciously attacked and beaten Arinze, leaving him for dead. During the assault, the Arinze had recognized one of the guards from the day Prince Ukandu married Princess Adan years earlier. Arinze was shocked and enraged to learn that Ukandu's own men had tried to kill him. As memories came flooding back, he recalled that the following day was meant to be his official coronation ceremony to become the High King over all five kingdoms. If he failed to appear, the corrupt High Priest would surely crown Ukandu in his place. Realizing the dire urgency of the situation, Arinza begged the hunter to help him and accompany him back to his village that very midnight. 
Though the hunter protested that Arinzi needed more time to regain his full strength, the determined prince insisted. He needed to find his father chief Uzo immediately and inform him of the assassination attempt. As Uzo was surely deeply worried over his son's mysterious disappearance, seeing the resolve in Arinze's eyes, the hunter finally agreed to make the journey with him under cover of night. They swiftly prepared supplies and set off, moving as swiftly as Arinze's battered condition would allow, driven by the knowledge that reaching Chief Uzo before dawn could be crucial in thwarting Ukandu's treacherous plot. They travelled through the dense forest by moonlight, making use of ancient hunting trails and wisdom to navigate the terrain swiftly yet safely. Arinza remained on a high alert, his nerves frayed, as every snapping twig or rustling brush raised fears that more of Ukandu's assassins could be lying in wait. However, the journey passed without any further incident, and as the first rays of dawn began peeking over the horizon, Arinza and the hunter finally arrived at the outskirts of the village. Arinze felt his heart clench at the familiar sights and sounds of the modest community that had been his entire world for so many years before his true destiny was revealed. Renewed determination filled his veins, fueled by righteous anger over the grievous wrongs committed against him simply for having the audacity to be born the rightful heir. No matter what further trials lay ahead, Arinz knew he could not allow the ancestor's sacred choice to be usurped by corrupt men like Ukandu and the High Priest. As they approached Chief Uzo's humble dwellings, Arinzi could see the elderly healer's silhouette sitting exactly where he had left him days earlier, maintaining a steadfast vigil while awaiting his adopted son's return. Despite the wounds, exhaustion and turmoil weighing on him, Arinz managed a tired smile, reassured that his father Figura still placed unwavering faith in him and the ancestor's grand design. As they approached Arinz's house, Chief Uzo was sitting outside, hopeful and believing that Arinz would return to him. He set his eyes on the figures approaching from a distance. Arinze called out, Father! Upon hearing his son's voice, Chief Uzo stood up swiftly and rushed to embrace his long-missing child, thanking the ancestors for seeing Arinze through his ordeal safely. However, Uzo quickly noticed the wounds and bandages covering Arinze's body. Deeply concerned, he immediately asked what had happened and who the accompanying woman was that had brought Arinze back. Uzo swiftly brought out a chair, and they sat down together that night to recount the harrowing events. The female hunter narrated how people dressed in royal bodyguard attire had viciously attacked and tried to kill Arinze. Being outnumbered three to one, the hunter could not intervene directly, so she hid and watched, waiting for an opportunity to help Arinzi afterwards. Arinzi then added that during the assault, he had recognized one of the guards from Prince Ukandu's wedding to Princess Adan years earlier. Upon hearing this, Chief Uzo grew angry, stating that he had known something was amiss on the day of the ancestral staff test. He had noticed suspicious signs and communication between Prince Ukandu and the High Priest, but did not pay it much attention, as he firmly believed Arinze would successfully lift the staff and return safely, guided by the ancestors. The wise healer thanked the ancestors once more for bringing his son back to him. It was then that the hunter realized with shock and surprise that the man she had been trying to revive was the prophesied king-to-be, Chief Uzo Said. My son, the high priest, grew impatient awaiting your return. When you did not arrive, they concluded the ancestors found you unworthy to lead our people. They have decided to install Prince Ukandu as the heir to the throne instead. News of this has spread across all five kingdoms. I fear they tried to prevent your return by attempting to kill you so Ukandu could become king. They have betrayed the ancestor's choice and your rightful claim. 
you must confront them before the illegitimate coronation takes place and expose their treacherous plot. The people must know the truth of what they have done to undermine the divine plan. Chief Uzo quickly devised a plan to storm the coronation grounds the following day and expose Prince Ukundu, the high priest, and everyone involved in the attempt on Arinz's life. They pleaded with the hunter to accompany them to the event, and though hesitant, the hunter ultimately agreed to join them, having no choice but to wait and see what fate had in store. As the night wore on, Thy discussed strategy and steeled their resolve for the confrontation to come. Arinzi, still recovering from his wounds, found renewed strength in the belief that the ancestors had preserved his life for a greater purpose to reclaim his rightful place as the chosen High King and bring justice to those who had tried to subvert the divine plan through violence and deceit. Chief Uzo tended to his son's injuries with a steady hand, applying healing salves and remedies passed down through generations of village healers. Though the wounds were severe, he could sense Arinzi's unbreakable spirit remained intact. His determination to fulfill his destiny burning brightly. The long hours ticked by as they waited for dawn's first light, making final preparations and seeking guidance from the ancestors through ritual invocations. That same night, Prince Ukandu was overjoyed, celebrating raucously with his guards and kinsmen. Everywhere was alive with excitement as they drank copious amounts of wine to commemorate their wicked act of treachery. Meanwhile, Princess Adan, who had previously been anxious for power and status, had undergone a profound change. She was now filled with anger and concern for Arinze, desperately hoping for his return to claim his rightful place. Disgusted by the celebrations, Adan angrily retreated to her chambers. Finally, the long-awaited day of Prince Ukandu's coronation had arrived. Men from every corner of the Five Kingdoms gathered at the coronation grounds, forming a vast crowd. Kings, nobles and queens were also in attendance, eager to witness the historic event. The High Priest stepped forward, a warm smile spreading across his face as he relished their apparent success in achieving their dreams through deceit. Prince Ukandu made his grand entrance greeted by raucous cheers from the crowd who were charmed by his presence. They were overjoyed at the prospect of finally having a king installed after such a prolonged period of waiting and uncertainty. The atmosphere crackled with excitement and anticipation as the elaborate coronation ceremony began unfolding. Chief Uzo, Arinze and the hunter emerged from the humble dwellings armed with grim determination and the truth as their greatest weapons. They set off towards the palace grounds where the illicit Kornation was surely unfolding even now. Arinze gripped the sacred ancestral staff tightly, drawing strength from the spirit of his noble birthright, coursing through the ancient totem. He was the true king, and no amount of treachery would be allowed to supplant that truth on this fateful day. The High Priest's son overheard coronation going on to crown Prince Ukandu as king. Disturbed by this, he rushed to Chief Uzo's house and met them on their way to expose his father's treacherous actions. He explained how the High Priest conspired with Ukandu, attempting to rig the process so Ukandu could seize the kingship through deceit. The son revealed he had witnessed his father trying to tamper with the sacred ancestral staff ensuring Ukandu could lift it fraudulently. Realizing the extent of their devious scheme to go against the ancestor's true chosen heir, he could not allow such treachery to crown an unworthy king over their people. When Chief Uzo heard this, he became enraged at the audacity of their plot. He pleaded with the high priest's son to join forces with them as they journey to the coronation ground, Arinze and the hunter to expose this evil before it could transpire in the kingdom. The young man agreed, his conscience not allowing him to stay silent. Meanwhile, at the coronation grounds, 
the high priest addressed the gathered crowd with a booming voice. Today we will crown our new king who will govern over all the kingdoms. He gestured grandly at the lavish setup, the ornate throne, the ceremonial coronation attire, and the drummers poised to provide the sacred rhythms. Princess Adan was very angry and not happy about what was happening and the injustice happening. Let the prince step forward to take his rightful place, the high priest proclaimed. Prince Ukandu strutted arrogantly through the crowd and took his place seated upon the throne, a smug sneer on his face. The high priest raised the ceremonial crown high, preparing to officially install Ukandu as ruler. But just as his hands began descending to place the crown upon Ukandu's head, a thunderous shout erupted from the entrance. Stop! All eyes turned to see Arinze, Chief Uzo, the hunter, and the high priest's son burst through the gates in dramatic fashion. Chief Uzo raised his voice loudly. Stop the coronation, you monsters! Arinzi set out his voice very loudly, saying, You plan to kill me and make Prince Ukandu the king. All eyes were on them. Princess Adan was very happy to see Arinzi alive. Meanwhile, King Chukwu Emeka said, Is this not Arinze, who they pronounced dead? What is happening? The high priest wanted to run, but the other five kings instructed their guards to hold him and Ukandu down which they did. As Chief Uzo, Arinzi, the hunter, and the high priest's son approached the place where they were coronating Prince Ukandu, Chief Uzo stepped forward to address the crowd. He said, Prince Ukandu sent his guards to kill Arinzi while he was on a ritual cleansing assignment to go and get items for the last ritual. Prince Ukandu wanted to protest, saying, that's a lie. I haven't hurt anyone in my lifetime. They should stone Chief Uzo to death for this allegation. The hunter stepped forward to narrate what she saw. She said, I recognize the faces of the three guards who tried to kill Arenes. I was resting after a long day of hunting when I heard a noise and a scream. I ran to check what was happening and behold, it was these three guards beating this young man, Arinzi. They beat him and left him lifeless, but I rushed to help him and saved his life. The hunter continued, I took Arinzi to my hut and tried to revive him for days, but he remained motionless. I thought he was dead, so I decided to discard his body in the forest to avoid being labelled a murderer. However, just as I was about to leave him in the forest, I heard a faint cough and wheezing sound. Arinzi was alive. I quickly brought him back to my hut and tended to him until he regained consciousness. Arinzi spoke up, his voice carrying across the stunned gathering. I remember seeing one of the guards on the day Prince Ukandu married Princess Adan many years ago. As the high priest attempted to protest and deny his involvement in the treacherous plot, his own son boldly stepped forward, holding a ceremonial staff. This was the fake staff my father, the high priest, had prepared in secret, meant to ensure only Ukandu could lift it during the final coronation test. The son's face was set in grim determination as he addressed the crowd. My father tried to rig everything in Prince Ukandu's favor from the start. I saw them conspiring and making plans together, but I hid this false staff without him knowing. A collective gasp rose from the assembled spectators as they realized the extent of the high priest's deceit and treachery. The holy man's eyes widened in shock and disbelief at his son's actions. Raising his voice angrily, he bellowed, Son, so you have betrayed your own father. How could you do this to me? But the son stood firm, staring levelly back at his father. You taught me to always stand against injustice and uphold the truth, no matter the cost. That is precisely what I am doing now. I don't care about anything else. The truth must prevail. 
I cannot fathom how you would stoop so low as to accept this evil and desperate spoiled prince's offer of riches over integrity. The high priest's shoulders slumped as the weight of his son's righteous condemnation struck him forcefully. There, before the wide eyes of every witness, the once highly esteemed holy man lowered himself to the ground and began pleading for forgiveness. In a trembling voice, he started narrating the full sordid tale of how Prince Ukandu had lured and enticed him into this dark plot. It, it began, when the arrogant prince approached me after the ancestral staff ceremony, fuming that he had been denied his birthright. The high priest proceeded to recount how Ukandu had promised him immense wealth, gold, jewels, land and more, if he found a way to circumvent the ancestor's ruling and illegally install the corrupt prince on the throne instead of Arinze. Temptation and greed had caused the high priest's moral fortitude to crumble. As he kept confessing, telling every detail of their evil plans, the people listening looked disgusted and angry. When he finally finished confessing, the main priest stayed quiet, waiting for punishment with his head down. The five main kings looked at each other, seriously understanding how serious the situation was. They nodded to their guards, who quickly grabbed the main priest, the three gourds, and Prince Ukandu, tying them up tightly with ropes and chains, even though Ukandu was shouting and protesting. King Chukwemeka. As the second king in command of the five kingdoms, then stepped forward, reminding the people of their harsh but unbending laws and traditions. King Chukwemeka's deep voice rang out across the gathered masses. Hear me, my people. Our most sacred laws strictly forbid any attempts to kill a recognized king or heir, or to undermine the divine process that determines the true ruler chosen by the ancestors. The punishment for such transgressions is swift and severe. He locked eyes with the shackled high priest and Prince Ukandu. Those found guilty of these most grievous crimes against our people will be put to death by ritual stoning. Their bodies will then be discarded and left to rot in the evil forest, their souls forever denied peace in the ancestral realm. The crowd nodded in agreement with the fair decision. Everyone watched the guilty men to see how they would react. At that moment, something in the main priest seemed to break. Maybe it was the guilt of his wrongdoings being exposed. Maybe it was the thought of such a shameful end after being in such a respected position for so long. Whatever it was, the main priest's eyes looked wild and crazy as he started losing his sanity. Realizing the terrible punishment awaiting him, the main priest couldn't handle the shame and pain anymore. He suddenly broke free from the guard's hold and rushed towards Prince Ukandu like he was crazy. Ukandu, still tied up tightly, couldn't react as the main priest pulled out a hidden dagger from his robes and stabbed Ukandu in the chest without any hesitation. Ukandu screamed in agony as the dagger went into his body, blood spraying everywhere. Everyone watching was horrified as the prince fell to the ground, bleeding heavily. The main priest, with wild eyes and heavy breathing, stood over him. For a moment, everything was silent. Then, the main priest seemed to realize how awful his actions were. With a determined look, he stabbed himself in the stomach with the dagger. He fell down next to the prince's body, their blood mixing together on the ground. People gasped and screamed as they tried to understand what had happened. Some cried at the tragedy, while others couldn't believe what they were seeing and turned away. Princess Adan, still seated upon her throne, was likewise struck dumb by the gruesome spectacle laid out before her. Despite once having been wed to Ukandu out of arrogance and greed, she felt no remorse at his vicious slaying. If anything, she was simply numb after so much turmoil and drama over the past days. Adan's eyes drifted over to Arinzi, battered but resilient among the chaos. In that moment, she understood just how blind she had been to his noble, unbreakable spirit when they were together in the village. 
pride, status and material pursuits had clouded her vision until the ancestors quite literally shattered all illusions. A small, sad smile tugged at the corner of her mouth as she gave an almost imperceptible nod of respect to the new High King. After the chaos calmed down, King Chukwemeka spoke to all the people gathered there one more time. His voice was heavy and serious. Let the dead bodies of these traitorous men be taken away from here. Prepare their bodies for their evil fate in the evil forest. But we must continue and officially make our new rightful king the ruler on this holy day. He turned to face Arinza, who still held the ancestral staff tightly, as if it was a lifeline keeping him grounded through all the insanity happening around him. Step forward, Arinze, so that we may officially crown you and make you the divine ruler over all our lands and peoples. Arinz took a deep breath to steady himself, then he stepped forward. Although he walked with a slight limp from his wounds that were not yet fully healed, an unmistakable aura of majesty surrounded him as he approached the ornate throne where Ukandu's blood-soaked dead body had just been dragged away. As Arinze moved to take his rightful seat upon the ancestral throne, King Chukwemeka gestured for the other kings in attendance to make way. One by one, the fellow kings bowed low, with their hands clasped together to show their loyalty and respect for the chosen High King. Even Princess Adan slowly rose from her seated position, propelled by forces beyond her control or conscious will. She felt an inexplicable sense of awe and reverence washing over her as Arinzi's piercing yet gentle eyes passed over her. This was no mere village drummer boy, but a man whose innate nobility shone brighter than a thousand suns. Adan had spent years pursuing power and status, only to be humbled by the one who had claimed it through an unshakable, humble spirit. As if in a dream, Adan felt her knees slowly bend until she too joined in the ceremonial bow, surrendering the last shreds of her pride before this living embodiment of everything she had forsaken in her quest for validation. Purity, truth, and the blessing of the ancestors. A powerful silence fell over the grounds as every figure remained frozen in a bow of obedience before their new sovereign. Only the gentle rustle of the ancient trees surrounding the area could be heard as Chief Uzo emerged from the crowd, his eyes shining with profound gratitude. The wise healer moved to stand at Arinz's side. He retrieved a simple but elegantly carved crown from a ceremonial box carried by an attendant. As he gently lifted the crown, sunlight glinted off its polished wooden surface, throwing dazzling refractions across the gathered people. Chief Uzo's voice rang out clearly, filled with the weight of generations. Do not kneel any longer, my brothers and sisters, for on this most blessed of days, the ancestors have at last revealed to us their chosen one. The rightful High King has been anointed. He put the, the crown on Arinz's head. As the coronation ceremony came to an end, everyone exited the grounds. Chief Uzo assumed the role of High Priest of the Five Kingdoms, while King Arinzi began to rule his people in a good and delightful manner. King Arinzi gained full access and control over all the assets that belonged to his late father, the previous king. This included being handed over the place and the building where Princess Adan was residing. According to custom and tradition, they lived together in the same large king's compound. Meanwhile, King Arinza compensated the hunter who had saved his life and rewarded her, lifting her out of poverty and they became close friends, where she visits the palace often. Princess Adan did not mourn her husband, Prince Ukandu, due to tradition and custom. Since her husband did not receive a proper burial because of his evil deeds, she was entitled to pick another man and marry, as per the customs. Despite this, she was now a changed person and started treating people with kindness and respect.
One night, Princess Adan was in her hut, deep in thought and weeping. She came up with an evil plan and decided to make peace with Arinzi and beg him for forgiveness before carrying out her sinister scheme. As morning approached, Princess Adan made her way to the palace where Arinzi normally held meetings with the Elder Council, arriving as early as possible. When King Arinze finally woke up and walked into his palace, he saw Adan. As soon as Princess Adan set her eyes on him, she fell to the floor, begging Arinz for forgiveness. She apologized to Arinz, telling him that she was not seeking to be taken back as his wife, but rather she wanted to make peace with him and beg for forgiveness for all the wrongs she had done to him and for the way she had let him down and disappointed him. Arinze, being the noble and kind-hearted man that he was, decided to forgive her. He asked her to stop crying and urged her that if she needed anything, she should tell him and he would make it available for her. They both made peace and became part of one big family. The next few weeks passed peacefully, with King Arinza diligently attending to the affairs of the five kingdoms. He worked tirelessly to heal the divisions and mistrust that had been sown by the corruption of Prince Ukandu and the High Priest. Arinzi made it a priority to listen to the concerns of his people and address their needs with fairness and compassion. Under his benevolent rule, the five kingdoms began to thrive once more. Trade flourished, crops yielded bountiful harvests, and a sense of unity and pride spread among the citizens. Arinze's humility and dedication to the ancestors' ways won him the respect and admiration of even the most skeptical subjects. As for Princess Adan, she remained in the palace compound, still grappling with the weight of her past transgressions. While she was grateful for Arinze's forgiveness, she could not seem to forgive herself for the way she had treated him and others in her pursuit of status and wealth. Adan spent many sleepless nights wrestling with her conscience, replaying the memories of how she had discarded Arinze's pure love like it was worthless. She knew she had been foolish and shallow, blinded by the allure of material things over the true riches of the heart and soul. In her darkest moments, Adan even contemplated taking her own life, feeling unworthy of the second chance she had been granted. However, thoughts of Arinze's boundless capacity for forgiveness and mercy always pulled her back from the brink of despair. One month later, Arinze and Princess Adan had become close again. However, Adan harbored a dark plan that she wanted to fulfill one last time. One night, after the daily meeting with King Arinze and his people, the king retreated to his chambers, deep in thought. During the meeting, one of the topics discussed and deliberated upon was the need for him to take a wife, as a king could not be complete without a queen by his side. After the meeting, as Arinze sat in his chambers, he found himself reminiscing about his past love for Princess Adan. Memories of their time together flooded his mind, and he began to wonder if it was the will of the ancestors for their paths to cross once more. He decided to take Adane back as his wife and informed his father figure, Chief Uzo, about his intentions. Arinze devised a plan to send for Chief Uzo in the morning so that they could discuss and deliberate on the matter, unaware of the dark plan that Princess Adan was plotting to execute. The next morning, as planned, Arinze summoned Chief Uzo, who arrived promptly. The king revealed his intentions of taking Princess Adan back as his wife, stating that perhaps it was the will of the ancestors for their paths to intertwine again. At first, Chief Uzo was unhappy with the idea, as he could not forget the pain and suffering Adan had caused Arinzi in the past. However, he could not bring himself to stand in the way of his adopted son's desires or the potential workings of the gods and ancestors. My king, Chief Uzo said, 
his voice tinged with concern. If it were up to me, I would not have allowed you to marry her or accept her back into your life, knowing the anguish she has put you through. But who am I to stop the ways of the gods and our revered ancestors? Arinze listened intently to Chief Uzo's words, understanding the older man's reservations. However, his heart was set on giving Adan another chance, believing that their love was meant to be rekindled. I understand your hesitation, father, Arinz replied, using the affectionate term he had always called Uzo. But I cannot shake the feeling that the ancestors have brought us back together for a reason. Adan has changed, and I believe she truly regrets her past actions. Chief Uzo sighed deeply, knowing that once Arinza had made up his mind, it would be difficult to sway him. He could only hope that the ancestor's wisdom would guide his adopted son down the right path. Very well, my king, Uzo conceded. If this is your wish, then I shall support you. Just promise me that you will be cautious and guard your heart, for it has already endured enough pain. Arenz nodded solemnly, appreciating Chief Uzo's concern for his well-being. He vowed to approach the situation with wisdom and discernment, determined not to repeat the mistakes of the past. As Arinzi and Chief Uzo were discussing the idea of taking Princess Adan as Arinze's wife again, one of Adan's maids came running in, shouting frantically, Your Majesty, come quickly! Princess Adan has drunk poison and is dying. Arinza and Chief Uzo's eyes went wide with shock and fear. They rushed out of the chambers, following the maid as she led them towards Adan's quarters. Their hearts pounded with dread over what terrible act Adan might have committed. When they reached Adan's chambers, they found her lying on the floor, and her breathing laboured. A small vial lay next to her. Its contents spilled out. It was clearly a lethal poison she had consumed. Adan, no! Arinze cried out, falling to his knees beside her. He cradled her head in his hands as Chief Uzo hurried to try and find an antidote or healer's aid. But it was too late. The poison had already taken its grip. Adan's eyes fluttered open slowly. Though her body was fading, her gaze held clarity and purpose. Arinze, she rasped out. Why, why would you do this to yourself, Adan? After I forgave you, after we spoke of taking you as my wife again? Arinze asked, his voice thick with anguish. The dying princess managed a small shake of her heed. No, you don't understand. I cannot allow myself to be your wife, your queen. I am not worthy of such an honor after the way I treated you. She covered harshly, each breath growing more strained. Tears filled Arinz's eyes as he listened to her words. What are you saying? The ancestors have shown me the path to forgiveness and a future with you by my side. Why would you throw that away? He pleaded with her. But Adan's gaze remained resolute, despite her weakening state. You are a good man with a pure heart. I was selfish and blinded by ignorance before. I let the lure of material wealth and status make me discard true love. She reached up with a trembling hand to gently caress Arinz's cheek. I want the world to know my story as a warning for generations to come. Instruct them not to follow the path I chose, chasing empty things over the fulfillment of the soul. Adan's eyes shone with conviction and hard-earned wisdom. True, unconditional love is eternal, but the trappings of riches and power are fleeting. I cast that truth aside once in my arrogance, and I cannot make that mistake again, even if you would grant me a second chance. Her gaze fell to Chief Uzo, who knelt beside them both with grief etched on his careworn face. Chief Uzo, Father of us all, please tell my dad, the king, that I loved him greatly, but I had to atone for the wrongs I committed. Uzo could only nod through his tears, 
overwhelmed by the young woman's powerful words and sacrifice. All around them, Adan's maids wept openly at the tragic scene unfolding. With a final rattling breath, Adan turned back to Arinza one last time. Farewell, my love. Let my story show the world to choose a path. Of true love over empty pursuits. For love transcends all. Her eyes slipped closed then, her chest stilling for the final time. Arinze clutched Adan's lifeless body tightly, sobbing into her hair as the full weight of her loss settled over him. Chief Uzo placed a comforting hand on the king's shoulder, his own cheeks stained by tears. Word of the princess's tragic death spread like wildfire across the five kingdoms, though she had once been an arrogant, status-seeking woman. Adan's powerful deathbed words resonated powerfully with the people. Her final redemptive act, sacrificing herself to atone for her sins, struck a chord deep within the citizens' hearts. They mourned the loss of their princess, who had found wisdom and humility at the very end. King Chukwemeka, Adana's father, was struck hard by the news, but he took solace in his daughter's newfound purity of spirit before passing. She is at peace now, he said simply, eyes shining with both sadness and pride. Adan was given an honored funeral befitting her status, attended by all members of nobility, as well as the common folk. Her sacrifice and dying message urging people to pursue love over material once left an indelible mark on everyone present. As per her wishes, the tragic tale of Princess Adan's journey from arrogant disgrace to hard-won enlightenment was retold across the five kingdoms over and over again, passed down as a parable for youths to learn from. In the months that followed, Arinze remained heartbroken over Adan's self-inflicted demise, but he understood the power of her choice and vowed to honor her message by leading as a noble ruler, guided by compassion and humility over selfish cravings. It was the hunter woman who had saved Arinze's life that ultimately helped the king's grieving heart to heal. Her own modest, kind-hearted spirit was the salve his wounded soul needed after such profound loss. In time, Arinza took her as his wife and queen, making her a living embodiment of the virtues Adani had urged the world to embrace. Their union was blessed with children who were regaled with the tale of their parents' intertwined destinies from the day they were born. The five kingdoms flourished under Arinzi's benevolent reign alongside his equally compassionate queen. The principles of unconditional love, integrity, and the pursuit of inner richness over vanity formed the bedrock beliefs that their society embraced wholeheartedly. And though the wounds of past turmoil would never fully heal, the people found strength in Princess Adan's tragic yet profound sacrifice, a poignant reminder that only truth could light the way forward into an enlightened future for all. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and drop your comments as we have more interesting content coming to this channel. Remember Princess Adan's last words and let them guide your daily activities. Always follow the rightful path and disregard material pursuits, for one day they will all fade away while true love will endure forever. Thank you and watch out for the next story.